you know, if you've got a two-year back order, you're not charging enough. And now by this time, I'm charging $600 for a chef's knife. This is unheard of. Right. Like this is a crazy amount of money for one knife, in my opinion. But I'm just like a guy that works out of his barn, you know. I drive an old pickup truck and and um, she goes, none of that matters. Whatever you think, it doesn't matter. The, the fact that you've got a two-year wait list shows you that there's a demand which outstrips your production. But uh, I was afraid to charge more because as an artist craftsman mind, you just want to please the people and you, and you don't want to I didn't want to make a mistake that would seem arrogant great businesses don't spring up out of nowhere building a business involves overcoming challenges experiencing failures large and small and putting in the work day in and day out welcome to season three of the building Bellingham podcast I'm your host Leo Cohen Thank you for joining me as we dive into the story behind one of Bellingham's biggest brands. I am super excited to sit down with Bob Kramer, master bladesmith and owner, founder of Kramer Knives. In our conversation, we talk about humble beginnings. We talk about the relentless pursuit of excellence. How can things be done better? How do you determine that you need to shift gears and go a different direction? How do you scale your business value, your dollars per hour, and ultimately the end product when you are the only employee? Why is it so important to let your customer define your business? How did Bob bust up a two-year wait list by creating a auction style business model? How do you balance between being an artist and a business owner? How did Bob determine when he was getting outside of the boundaries of what he loved to do and wanted to do? What were some of those moments that hit him in the head and said, eh, I'm not going to make that type of knife again? And how do you celebrate milestones by driving up to Mount Baker with a cooler of beer and cracking them and watching the sunset? Super excited to have you all back for this episode, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. And a quick disclaimer, we did not juggle knives during this podcast. Bob Kramer, welcome to the studio, the Building Bellingham Studio. It is a drizzly classic northwest day yeah happy to be here so let's let's jump right into it you have a history that brought you into this business that you own and this industry that you're in i know that there was a pivot point where you went from a point in the restaurant industry and there was this this kind of this reoccurring problem or pain point in the in the in the chef world um so what was that pain point that you noted and what was your life like up to until that point I was working at the Four Seasons in Seattle. It was the best hotel in Seattle. So this is during the 80s. You know, we just were top of the game. The rooms were, the food was, the kitchen service was uh, kind of the cornerstone of what the Four Seasons was all about. And uh, I was going to college, North Seattle Community College, and I was taking lots of science classes. I was on my way to go to the University of Washington to study oceanography. As you say, I'm using knives every day in the kitchen. And at one point, my knives got dull. And so we had a tri-stone, like an oil stone that was mm -hmm. in the kitchen. We And the kitchen is huge. There were 60 cooks, right? But that's that's counting all shifts and all restaurants. So they weren't all 60 in one kitchen. But it was a big staff. During that time, I don't think I ever saw anybody except for the garmage chef use the tristone. Other than that, people just, uh, I don't know where they got their knives sharp. You know, there was a, there was a sharpening place in town called Sea Cutlery. And I just thought it's, this is interesting. Like we're in this super nice hotel with these really talented cooks and chefs and nobody seems to be taking care of their knives themselves. And so I thought, well, that's curious. I mean, how hard can this be? I'm taking calculus at North Seattle Community right. College. <laughs> I'm studying physics. Like, you know, knives are 4,000 years old and everything has evolved. So I asked a few people and and no one seemed to be 100% competent with the sharpening stones. And I thought, well, this is curious. I, I want to learn this. So that was the inflection point, the pain point where it was like, I just decided I'm going to learn how to do this so that I can take care of my own knives. And it turned out to be much more difficult to actually find a really simple explanation 
and someone that could do it competently. Was there, were there books in, in, in libraries that you could go and, yeah, so, and tap so into? I started at the library. I went to yeah. the library and I looked, you know, under sharpening and I found a reference book. I'm like, oh, this looks really interesting. And it had like a French name. And, and so, you know, when you pull the card out of the card catalog, you, you write down the number and put the card in and then, or I guess the card didn't actually come out, but you write the number down and then take it up to the reference library. And, and she goes, well, we don't have this book here. This book is, it's in the library at Congress. But, oh, wow. But we get it for you. I'm like, seriously. Like, yeah. she goes, yeah, from, I go, where's it coming from? She said, DC. <laughs> so I go, okay. She goes, it'll be here like in a week. They just mail it. I'm like, well, okay, cool. I want to see that. So the book shows up. They give me a, like a postcard or something shows up in the mail. I go down to the library and, and I give her the postcard and she gives me this book. And she says, you can't take that out. You could just use it, you know, use this room and you can look at this book. The book was 200 years old. And is this like a, this is not a small book. This is a pretty good size book. This is a big book. It's, it's not quite coffee state table size, but it's big. It's like a big textbook, a big, thick, heavy book. And it's 200 year old written in high French. And it was a survey done by a guy on the cutlery industry back in the late 17, 1800s. And he wrote this really thorough text on the cutlery industry and each aspect of how they made knives. So from abrasives to glue, to wheels, to steel, to drilling holes, the problem was it's in French. The whole thing is in high French. And I, do you, do no, you speak French? No, no. I'm dyslexic. I can barely <laughs> speak English. Were there at least pictures in there? Yeah. The, okay. That, that was the saving grace. <sighs> wow. Right? Okay. That's yeah. good. Good so, start. So there were uh, like engraving. And so there was a picture at the beginning of each each chapter. And, and so, you know, I, I'm just flipping through the book and there's pictures of workshops. <clears throat> These workshops had uh, very often in the 17, 1800s, a workshop was situated so that one side of the shop would have a lot of windows so that natural light could pour in. And then there was a big shaft that would come in that was driven by a water wheel. So these places were often located uh, beside a river and the river would turn a water wheel and, and that power could be turned on and off. You could direct the water onto the wheel or off the wheel and that would turn the power on and turn the power off. And that big water wheel would drive a great big shaft that ran the length of the workshop. And off of that shaft were a number of wheels and long leather belts would come down and drive these different machines. And so there were pictures in this book of, of what these workshops looked like. And, and I thought it was all fascinating. It wasn't really any help for me <laughs> to sharpen knives that next day, like, okay, I learned a bunch of stuff in there and now I'm going to go sharpen my knives. I'm like, I figured that technology had just moved on and and there must be something super slick and compact and small. and That has evolved from that exactly. concept. Yeah, yeah, here we are 200 right. years later. There's got to be something super slick. So I kept looking. I kept asking. I just kept asking. There's got to be somebody around. And I went to the cutlery store that was in Seattle, the sharpening store. Mm -hmm. There were two guys. And I offered a, like, can I sweep the floor? Do you need somebody to work here? I'd love to learn how to do this. And they just shoo me away. No, no, no. Things go away. Get. And so I just kept asking people and looking for more books. And there weren't any books, really, that were well-written. I ran into, somebody had told me about a, a guy who was importing Japanese tools. They go, yeah, go talk to Toshiro. He knows how to sharpen a knife and he'll explain it to you. I drove down there one day before my shift. So my shift started at three and um, I probably went down there at 1.30. And it's a small little standalone building, little tiny parking lot, very quiet. Didn't see any other cars in there. Walk in, very Spartan little showroom and the tools sort of laid out on all these tables. Nobody's in there. So I walk up to the counter and Mr. Toshiro comes out. He's very quiet. He says, can I help you? And I said, yeah, you know, somebody told me you could help teach me about sharpening. And he nodded. And then he reached underneath the counter and he started to pull out props, like a little wooden stake and a piece of paper. And, and it turns out he was a teacher. So this guy was a PhD in like electrical engineering. He taught at the UW and clearly he liked to teach. And he methodically went through from beginning to end what was necessary. And, wow. and I'm talking four times faster than Mr. Toshiro would talk. Right. Mr. Toshiro was very deliberate and very clear. And he launches into this lecture. And I'm, I'm about 
10 minutes into this lecture and I, and I realize I'm committed. Right. That can't leave. No. And I cannot interrupt him. He is divulging what I have been seeking and he's doing it so clearly like this is my guy this is the dude this is like the yeah. wizard he's showing me so i can see the time getting closer and closer to like i got a half an hour i gotta get to the force i can't be late i gotta get to work you right know, i gotta shift but i can't go anyways he explains the whole thing i'm late for work i get in some trouble for that but i'm like i got the nuggets he right. gives me the gem so that that was that was the beginning of it that was the beginning. It yeah. started with the book. And then also through word of mouth, I want to talk about the whole con concept of resourcefulness. Um, tell me a little bit more about, was it just the drive or the passion for what you were starting to learn that said, oh, I'm not going to take no, I'm not going to take dead ends. There's somebody out there. What was that? <laughs> What's that like to have this feeling of someone's got to know this and I'm going to figure it out at all yeah. costs. I'm going to be late to work. I have to understand this. Yeah, it was really fear driven because I had put enough time into college and I was I was just about to get my associate's degree and transfer to the UW. And a number of people said, what are you going to study? I said, oceanography. And they're like, uh, you, you know, you're going to have to get a master's or a PhD to do like the cool stuff. Right. And I said, really? And they're like, yeah, like an undergrad's not going to get you anything. Like, and I was like, oh, no. So so I'm dyslexic. And college was incredibly difficult. I got to read something three times. You and me both. For it to Words stick. start flying off the page for me. And I go to sleep. Like yeah. as soon as I start reading a text, I'll go to sleep. So it's incredible. And my note taking is horrible. And I didn't get that until like the first quarter, first year college that some professor said, you got this thing. Like no one had even heard of that word, right? When the, the high school that I went to. It was illuminating, you know, it was like made sense. And I eventually learned to study better. But the idea of having to go to get a PhD was overwhelming. And I thought, and I'm working full time in a, in a restaurant at a hotel and I'm going to school full time. I had to carry a full load because I thought I got to get out of college as soon as I can. Like this is grueling. This is brutal. Right. I don't know if you've ever worked in a restaurant, but it's, I have. it's, it's brutal. Yeah. So I'd had that realization like, I don't think this college pathway is going to work for me. And it wasn't like, oh, I just get a business degree that I'll be fine. Like I didn't see the goal as once I get this college degree that I'm, I'm free, I could get a job anywhere. I didn't believe that. And why not? Because I think I'd seen a number of friends and people that I had known who had college degrees that it didn't matter. Like they weren't working in their field. Right. And it seemed like a box that they wanted to check off. And I had convinced myself, I mean, I kind of monitored how much energy I was putting out between doing my study and, and working in the hotel. And I convinced myself if I put in this much focus, time and energy in my own business, I had to be successful. I must be successful. I just had to pay attention. And I believe that. I truly believe that to my core. I saw an opportunity because nobody knew how to sharpen their knives in the fanciest restaurant in Seattle. So I go, well, I think that there's an opportunity here. Maybe I can just start a sharpening business. If I can make a hundred bucks a day, 500 bucks a week, I'll be good. Right. That's all I need. And this seems like a solid way to make a living. It seems like an honorable way to make a living. You know, I was never going to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. I, that, that just had become clear to me. So when you ask about my commitment, there is no net. Like I had no, there was nothing to fall back on. I know like, the feeling. And yeah. I, I mean, there's no family business. There's no family money. And so like, I got to dig, I got to paddle. And, and how old are you at this point? I'm 23, two, three. So what's that like as a 22, 23, a young 20s yeah. Bob in the world yeah. and having this this kind of like this thought or this feeling continue to kind of whack you in the head and say, I know everybody else is doing it this way or this is what has been con we've been conditioned to believe. Yeah. But you just had this compass that said, no, I'm just going to go this way. And I think if I put this time and effort and devotion towards something, I think I can be equally as successful and I'll have control over my my life. Yeah. The control thing I think was important. You know, when I looked at other people, a lot of people, either their family was paying their way to school and they didn't mm -hmm. have to work. I'm thinking that seems like a sweet deal, but it wasn't the deal I had. So I just had to keep looking at my cards. Like mm -hmm. he here's the deck I've got. 
so how do I play this hand the best? Again, it was fear driven. Like I've got to figure something out. And so I thought, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try to set up this little sharpening business and I'm going to see where it goes. I'll see if I get any traction. And if that doesn't work, then I'll come up with another idea. So there's this as an entrepreneur, this is like, you don't know you're an entrepreneur yet. And I think the word entrepreneur is so lightly thrown around. Yeah. I call it entrepreneur. Everybody wants to yeah. create and innovate, but you, you had this, the feeling of entrepreneurship, which is I want to have control over my life yep. and I'm going to give this my best shot yep. and focus on the things that I'm really good at and the, or the things that I'm passionate about. Cause that's important too. Yep. And I'm going to dive into it. And if it doesn't work this way, I'm going to see how I can angle it a different way, essentially. Yep. So how did you, how do you start a business? How do you get all of the operations going? Cause it's not just sharpening the knives. Right. It's that's the biggest misconception right. is it's not just about the product or the service. It's about all of the things that make that better and support that. But ultimately there's so much back end stuff that for goes sure. into running a business. So what was that like for you at 23 years old? So I was completely ignorant and had no idea. I thought it was pretty simple. You know, you just make a product or put out a service, they pay you and that's that. It's just that easy. Right. Um, and I believe that I just jumped into it and, um, you know, eventually I, I bought an old, I, at first I had a mail truck. I had an old right hand, you know, the short little squatty mail trucks mm -hmm. that drive on the on the three wheels. No, no, this is a four wheeler. Okay, but it had a right hand drive. Okay, right. So the steering wheels on the other side, and uh, a little tiny back end, and and I bought this machine that was supposed to be like the great thing to sharpen with, and I and I started with that, and I had a hundred foot extension cord. So I'd drive this truck up to the restaurant to get the knives. I'd plug into their outlet. So you get this cord going across the sidewalk out to the parking lot. It turns out the machine was not great. And, and I hadn't really learned to sharpen yet. You know, eventually it became really clear, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm dragging these knives through a machine. I'm, there's no skill involved. And then the machine, there were parts of the machine that would wear and I'd have to replace them. There was a chef at one point that said, you know, these knives aren't really sharp. And he was right. And I had to pay attention to him. Somebody had told me along the way, your customers will teach you your business. If you're willing to listen to them, they will teach you what your business is. And so at first I resisted this guy's advice, but he said, these knives are sticking to the cutting board. They're not gliding. And I go, well, yeah, that's because they're so sharp. And he goes, no, nope, that's not what's going on. You've got little teeth on the edge of this knife. And that's what's grabbing into the wood on this cutting board. And they'll go dull in three days. And I go, okay, I'll come back tomorrow and I'll check the knife and I'll come back the next day and I'll come back the next day. And he was right. So I was willing to listen to him and I was willing to, to accept the fact that I was wrong and I didn't know what I was doing. So I had to reformulate my plan. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And so Eastern Airlines was mm -hmm. a, an airline that was in business back then. And they had a deal mm -hmm. where you could buy a ticket and go to six different cities for 700 bucks. So I flew all over the country for like two days in each place. And I'd get a hotel and I'd get a Yellow Pages and I'd look for sharpening and I'd look for cutlery stores. And I went to big cities like Chicago, New York, Atlanta, Houston, San Francisco, LA. And, and I tried to find like, what's the state of the art? Who are the guys that really know what the hell they're doing? And, and what does their workshop look like? Maybe they'll show me the room. Maybe I'll just get a picture. I think the other thing about dyslexics is that we learn visually mm -hmm. and kinesthetically. And so I had a lot of confidence. If I see it, I'll know it. Right. If I see it, I'll recognize the work and I'll recognize the method. And then I just have to replicate that. Most of it was really bad. Uh, the work and the workshop that I saw, the workshops that I saw until I got to San Francisco. And then I went into this little place in North Beach called Columbus Cutlery. And it was run by this Italian couple. And Otilia was probably late 60s, maybe early 70s. And I, I went in their tiny little place. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm interested in what you do sharpening wise. Can I see some of the work? And she said, oh, sure. She unrolled, you know, five or six knives that had come in to be serviced. And they were perfect. They were perfect. They were like, holy shit. And I said, any chance I can see the workshop? And she goes, oh yeah, sure. And so she, you know, I get to go behind the counter and I meet Peter. So Peter's this Italian guy. He's probably 70 years old. And there's the power shaft overhead. 
And there's from the book on these, yeah, same thing as this <laughs> 200 year old book. And there's this big water wheel, just like in the book. And there's all these leather wheels with abrasive on them. Like, it's the same thing. It's the same thing as in the book. I said, Can you show me how to sharpen a knife? So he took a knife, he put it on the water wheel, and he stepped his way down through all these abrasives. And at the end of it, it was perfect. It looked just like the ones that were on the counter. I'm like, that's it. It may be 200 years old, but that still works today. And and this machine that I had in the back of my truck was bullshit. It, it, it just was, they were trying to do what Peter was doing, but it's impossible to do in this little box. It's kind of like, Theranos that was trying to go, oh, we have this little blood machine. Right. We're going to put in every Walgreens. It's like, it's impossible. You can't do that. Right. So that was it. I walked out of that place and I was in there for maybe 15 minutes. And oh, it just, and it just all clicked. Yeah. It was like my mind just captured what Peter had done. And I go, I have to replicate that and I have to do it in a truck. And so that took me you know, I bought an old bread truck and I started to buy equipment and save up money and, you know, put in lights and shelving and blah, 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 and and try to replicate it. And then practice. Like once I had the machines and I had to take guesses at RPMs and and like, where do I get the abrasive and, and where do I get the glue and a lot of trial and error. And I'd buy stuff and it would work and I'd buy new stuff. But at that point, I had latched on to... I'm going to do this. And so you just keep slogging. There's no know? turning back. You just keep going. Um, one thing that you talked about that really resonates with me and fascinates me and I have a lot of respect for is this conversation around humility, especially coming from the position where you are, when you are running a business and you have a service or product, you think of yourself as I have to be the expert at all times. Right. And one thing that you talked about was your customers define your business talk a little bit about the lack of ego and the presence of humility. Ego, to a certain extent, confidence is important, right? Direction is important. So how did you keep that in check? Have you always just been open to information or have you, how did you, did you battle with that a little bit saying, this is my business and I have to be the expert? The, The whole fake it till you make it thing was sort of running in the back of my head. And so I was trying to like, have some confidence and and walk in with confidence and present myself to the chef in such a way that he would allow me to sharpen some of their knives. And, you know, so, so the presentation was there, but honestly, when I was back out in the truck and dragging my knives through this machine, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I have no control. I have no way to kind of modify. There were certain knives that I was dragging through this machine. It was like, this isn't right. This isn't the right way to treat this tool. So I knew on some level. And then I had to admit that I was just, I had gone down the wrong trail and I dead ended. And I go, I have to, I have to turn around. I go back to the trailhead. I got to make a new choice. I want to learn this. I want to know this. I do want to be the expert. I want to be the guy that when the chef says, can you sharpen this? And if I say no, explain to him why it's not possible. I don't have a machine big enough. It won't fit in the back of my truck or those things don't get resharpened, whatever that was. If I'm presenting myself as the, as the sharpener guy, then I should be the expert. Right. And in order to be the expert, you had to research the expert. Right. So what was that experience like in that stage of vulnerability? You're like, you're going around, you're, you're, you're just like, I just need to become the expert. And you meet, you know, all of these different, um, sharpening shop owners around the country. Yeah. Some operations weren't that you just said, that's not right. right. That's not how I want to do it. And then you, you ran into these folks in San Francisco. What was that like for you to have someone that clearly had, had the the model based on the book? And that was probably mind blowing. Yeah. And then the second piece, they were very, it sounds like they were very welcoming into their shop saying, yeah. well, look, this is, you know, obviously we know what we're doing. We've mastered this, but we're willing to share it with you. What was uh, that experience like? It was amazing. You know, it was like finding Mecca. It was just, I just felt so grateful and that they were so sweet. You know, they were so sweet and so nice and and very humble. Like they were really good, but they weren't cocky about it. They were just very humble. Like this is what we do. And again, it was a very short meeting and, and I don't think it completely penetrated or percolated how that that was really a key turning point and that I had to replicate what I saw there probably wasn't it for a couple of years before my technique could match Peter's. So it, it took a whole bunch of work, not not just having the machine set up, but you got to practice at it. 
you know, you got to get good at it and get the get the shape down right because you still have to modify that piece of steel, that hardened steel. You can have all the right tools, but you still got to do it right. So it's just like cooking. You'd have a great stove and pans and and great ingredients, but you know it's going to take a while to get your chops down to really figure out how to not torture a piece of salmon or torture. I love it. That's know? a great word for it. Yeah. There's lots of people out there torturing salmon. Yeah. R.I.P. to the salmon. Okay, so there's a tipping point. You're 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 working on the sharpening side of the business. You're around blades all the time. What was the tipping point for you to say, "Well, I'm going to I'm going to make one." Business sort of took off. I could confidently walk into a to a restaurant, go up to the chef or the kitchen manager and say, "You know, here's my business card. I'm I'm sharpening tools. I'll do it right here on site. Give me the worst knife you got. I'll sharpen it for free. I'll come back and see you in 2 weeks if you like my work." Maybe we could do business. And, you know, they give me just some horrible tool that had been abused for most of its life. Like a gardening tool, essentially. Yeah, or a serrated blade that no longer had serrations on it anymore and was used for a grill scraper. And they're right. like, yeah, this is a bread knife. So I'd have to re <laughs> it, re, you know, thin it out. But I could do that, you know, and I could give them a tool that was as sharp as it was new or sharper. So the business grew, but it's, it's, uh, it's dirty. You know, it's, it's a lot of grinding. And uh, during the summertime, it's hot. You mm -hmm. know, and I'm working in this small, confined space. I was out at an Anthony uh, home port in uh, Bellevue. Mm -hmm. And they only served dinner out there. They didn't do lunch. And so I had the kitchen to myself and, and a lot of knives. I probably had 80 knives that I had to sharpen up. So I was there at two. And I wasn't done until probably five o'clock or four o'clock maybe. And all the cooks are coming in. And, you know, young guys generally are, are who's in the kitchen. And so I laid all the knives out and I put a sign up on the wall. Please be careful. Knives are freshly sharpened. And then I went up to the manager and I was getting paid. They pay me in cash there. And so it was my last stop of the day. It was on a Friday. I'm kind of grateful to get out of there. And I remembered this one 19 year old kid and uh, I laid the knives out and he came and he picked up a 10 inch chef's knife and he thumbed it, you know, and he looked at me in the eye and he goes, it's not that sharp. And I go, eh, okay. I said, just, just be careful. You know, I go, it's a real polished edge. So it may not feel the way you think it should feel for sharp, but just be careful with it until you get used to it. So I'm up with the managers, I'm getting paid and somebody runs out and says, Chris has split his leg open and he's laying on the chef's desk. So we all run back there and this kid had cut his thigh deeply. And so he had, there was probably a little polishing compound still in the knife and he had wiped it off on his apron oh. and it sliced through the apron, it sliced through his pants and it split his thigh wide open. And so they had to scoop him up, take him to the hospital and he had three levels of stitches. So two levels of intramuscular stitches and then the surface skin stitching. And it was so, the, the experience was so, he was disrespectful to me. Like right. He was being cocky. And, you know, I was just the sharpener guy. I came in through the back door. It's kind of like the chimney sweep. So it's dirty and like this poor slob can't get a job. And so he's got to sharpen knives. I'm like, yeah, I guess you could say it that way, but I kind of like what I do. And I sort of make your life easier. And, you know, he didn't respect or could appreciate how sharp the knives were, but he does now. Right, I'm sure he, he does. He'll never forget Forever. that. Forever. Yeah. And so I had to drive home across the uh, across the bridge, and, you know, traffic's really horrible on a Friday night. And I'm just sitting there thinking, like, I don't like being in traffic. I don't like how people are disrespectful. And I think I'm done driving around. Seattle is starting to get really busy mm -hmm. uh, traffic-wise. And this is probably uh, late 80s, right? Early 90s, the dot-com thing is kicking in. Mm -hmm. And lots of people are moving into Seattle. And I'm like, you know, I'm spending more time in my truck going from restaurant to restaurant. And I'm kind of bored. I need to find something else. So that's the internal compass going this no longer suits me. And I'd solved all the problems. So now it was just a grind. Now it was just like, how many knives can I sharpen in a day? How much money can I make? It was like, it wasn't really scalable because of the amount of time and skill that it took to learn how to do it. And it's just you. It's just me. Yeah. And so I picked up, I, I was sharpening one day. And I picked up a magazine on the way out of, I was like Queen Anne Thriftway or something. And it, there was a magazine on the shelf waiting in line. I got my sandwich, my Fritos, and I picked up this magazine called Blade Magazine about custom knives. So I'm out in my truck, I'm eating my sandwich, and I'm flipping through this magazine. And these guys had made knives from scratch. 
a leaf spring from a car and they turn it into this beautiful knife with a maple handle. Like, how the fuck do you do that? Like, I yeah, want to do poof, that. right? Yeah, that's cool. I don't even know where to begin. Literally, I don't know where to begin, but I want to, I want that. So the journey started over again. Yeah. What was your first move to step into that space? Because it's up, a, sign up for a class in right? Arkansas. In Arkansas. Yeah. Okay. Right. So Arkansas. is that the only place you can get to this class? Yeah. Okay. So you go to Arkansas. What what happens well, next? I had to wait six months before I could go. They had like four classes a year and and the last one was filled out. So I had to wait till Jan. So that's like maybe October. So they go, oh, we won't have class scheduled till January. So I go, I'll wait till January. And like January 2nd, I'm calling them up. She's like, oh, we don't have it yet. Call tomorrow. So I get it. You know, I'm like on it. Yeah. Like yeah, I'm getting in this class, lady. So you can either take my name now or I'll call you tomorrow morning and the next day and the next day. It was the same deal. You know, you just like I latched onto this. I'm like, I got to be in this class. I have to see how this goes with no intention of wanting to be a knife maker. I just wanted to add that information to my repertoire. Right. And I don't know what the next choice is, but I do want to make a knife. And, a, and I got this two week class. So then, so I get in the class, but the class doesn't start till June. So I got to wait six months, but I can think about it and look forward to it and start reading books on it. So I pick up a few books on knife making. I'm looking through them and I'm looking at the machinery. I'm like, I don't have any room for that. I don't even know how that thing works. I'm not even sure I understand what's happening in this picture. So then I go to the class for two, two weeks and, and, uh, you know, it's Arkansas in the summertime. So it's mm-hmm. like, 100 degrees and it's humid dark, fucking humid really crazy yeah. humid and uh, we're forging with coal and and you know you're swinging an eight a hammer eight hours a day and it's not a framing hammer it's like a smithing hammer so that was it you know I, I, I we made knives and and they were cooler and and they could do this stuff they could bend chop a two by four shave hair i'm like i don't know any kitchen knives that i've been sharpening that have all of those attributes like this is cool somehow i'm gonna do this like as a hobby on the weekend for the rest of my life. I just decided like, you know, coming from a kitchen hotel, we'd throw big parties, like people would throw big parties and we'd right. cook them up. Right. And it might take some, some banquets and stuff would take a week to prepare to everything. prep all the food for yeah. the, the moment where you actually have to cook. Yeah. Wow. Assemble, put it out. And then like, you know, out into the, out into the dining room. After three or four hours, it's gone. It's all gone. Just, you know, these big carts would come back with dirty dishes and wine glasses and stuff. And all that food, all that work was gone. Hopefully they had an amazing time and it made for a great memory for them. But we had to start over. So in a way, it's kind of humbling. It's almost like the Zen sand paintings, like Mm -hmm. the Buddhist monks do these sand paintings about impermanence. So the sand paintings are incredibly intricate and beautiful and they take days or weeks to make. And then they, at the end, you observe them and then you scoop it all up and they'll put it like in a container and then they take it down to a river and then they just slowly let it drizzle out into the river and it, and it all goes away. And it's, a, it's an exercise in impermanence. They don't need to take a selfie to put on Instagram. It's, right. they, they observe it, they appreciate it, they intake it, and then it's, they allow it to go away. And I can appreciate that now, but you know, I was... 27 years old and and I I wanted something and after the knife making class I had something tangible. So even though I'd maybe taken a week or 4 days to make a knife in the same way that I'd taken a week to do a banquet, but now I got this knife that I can use over and over and over again and it and it lit me up. It it made me happy every time I picked up that tool and cut an onion or you know sliced up a chicken breast or something like that. I was like, god, this feels good. And this thing's never going away. So All the energy I took to put this together is now stored up in a sense in that tool. Whereas all the energy that I put into the meal hopefully went into the memory of that meal. Right. Okay. So you're, you're, you're doing the sharpening still. You, you feel like you've mastered that craft. You feel like you've, you've stepped on the top of that mountain. You understand it. You get to kind of a place of boredom because you're on the grind and now it's a business. Yep. What was the point that was similar to that with the the knife making business, the, the bladesmithing, where you said, well, this is no longer a hobby and this is starting to interest me more, pique my interest or push me yeah. faster, accelerate me right. over this other, other job yeah. or this so, other business? So this turning point was, I think, very interesting because I had taken the class. I came home. I was super pumped about mm-hmm. it and just went, 
I got to figure this out. And I had a friend who had an anvil and I said, can I borrow that? And he said, yeah, sure. You can borrow it and, you know, keep it for a month or whatever. I had a place I was renting and it had a one car garage, didn't have a door on it. Just a one tiny one car garage that was built like early 1900s. And I go, well, I'm going to build a little forge in here. And I'd never built a forge before. I just decided I'm going to put this together. Like I have to keep the momentum up. Like I'm jazzed about this. And if, if I don't do it right away, I'll, I'll forget the details. You know, I got some black iron pipe from the hardware store and a propane tank and a hair dryer and castable refractory. And, you know, I put a forge together and, and lit the thing off and, and started forging leaf springs. And, and literally, I'd maybe done two days of forging and a, and a buddy of mine had come by and he and I had done a bunch of stuff together. We had made masks together and we'd done some theater together. We were always exploring and, mm-hmm. and, and trying new stuff and cut, kind of jazzed, get excited about like, what are you working on? I'm going to go work on, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to try and make paper mache masks. I'm like, oh, that's cool. What kind of mask? And so we just talk and get excited. And, and so he comes by on his bike and I'm forging on something. And, you know, I'm still not good at all i'm i'm still learning but i've now got a thing that can heat up a piece of steel to 2000 degrees and i got an anvil and i got a hammer and i know sort of what to do i just have to keep practicing and it's sort of meditative in the sense that it takes a while between heats and so you're pounding and you're focused on how to try to move the metal but it's a dance though the material will do certain things and and it won't do other things and you have to learn it you have to read it you have to find out what it will do and what it won't do and it takes practice and and then you've only got a period of time like 60 seconds 90 seconds to forge on it and then it's too cold and it won't move anymore and you can damage the material so it's got to go back in the fire you get two or three minutes to stand there and sort of think about what your next moves are and so he had come by and i was forging on a piece and uh, he watched me for a while and he's like this is pretty wild. This is pretty cool. Uh, What do you think you're going to do with this? I said, you know, I'm going to stop driving my sharpening truck around. It just is not, it doesn't fill me up anymore. I'm like, I don't like traffic. I don't like people being disrespectful. I want to open a store downtown Seattle, very old fashioned, that it looks like it's been there for a hundred years. I'm going to set up a Smithy. I'll sell real retail. So I'll sell a bunch of kitchen knives. We'll still do the sharpening, but people are going to have to drive to me instead of me driving to them. So you just have to drive once or ride your bike once, and that's to to the uh, to the space. Get to the space. I love and it. I, and I said, you know what? I think they're going to be more respectful if they have to pack their stuff up, drive it to me, leave it with me, drive away, come back and pick it up. I think they're going to be more respectful of what I do. It's too convenient. I right. just show up at the back door. It's like too easy for them. Right. And they're like, oh, yeah, this happens all the time. I was like, well, guess what? Not anymore. Like, yeah. come in here. And then I'll have the space where when I'm not sharpening, I can make knives. Literally, this is the weirdest thing. Like the next. So that idea became very clear in my head. Like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm talking to Tom and I'm like, I- I'm going to do that. And then I started to think, how are you going to do that? So the next, I want to say two days later, I'm driving my truck around downtown Seattle, going to restaurants. I'm driving down First Avenue and I'm at First and Royal Brome. So the kingdom is basically mm-hmm. right down there. I look to my left and there's a for lease sign and there's, it's right on the street. It's a single story building right on the street, for lease sign. So I take the number down and I call the guy. There's a pay phone. There's no cell phones, but there's a pay phone. I call the guy. He goes, oh yeah, I'm in the back. Come, come around and... I'll show you the space. So go in, it's 4,000 square feet, wood floors, old wood floors, used to be a warehouse, great big cedar beams that were probably 12 by 12 cedar beams, and then cedar beams on the ceiling. It it is not fancy. This is like a funky old warehouse. But I also had windows. I had probably had uh, 100 feet of storefront windows. So 4,000 square feet. I go, how much is it? He goes, it's $925 a month. So it was 25 cents a square foot. So cheap. So inexpensive. And I said, could I get a five-year lease? He's like, yeah, sure. I go, okay. So I got to be honest. I want to put a smithy in here. I want to put a forge in here and pour, you know, one area, I'll pour some cement on the floor and then put a hood. I got to punch a hole through the ceiling and put a hood in. He's like, kid, you can do whatever you want. (laughs) Sign a lease, pay 925, go crazy. Hey, it's Leo. We'll be back to the interview in a moment. 
but if you're new to the Building Bellingham podcast, I wanted to say hello. I'm a local real estate agent with the Cone Group Northwest, powered by the Moyot Group Realtors. We do real estate differently, and this community podcast is part of it. Check us out by searching Cohen Group Northwest on your favorite social media platform. And thank you for listening. So literally two or three days from the time that I talked to Tom and had this vision. It manifested. It did. You just move your shop. You just move your location. Or is that when you said, oh, this is Kramer Knives? Like when did you start to define the business? I mean, you're just, you're just getting into this. Yeah. You're just like, everything's moving fast. Yep. And you're like, okay, I have the space now and I have to build out the space or I have to customize the space to what I need. What was that process like going, okay, now I'm in the space. It's has everything that I need that I think I know that I need right now. There's obviously going to be future purchases and things that I need to do. But at that point, when did it become a business? Well, so it was a business. So I sharpened knives for five years in the truck. So I had a bunch of accounts already. Mm -hmm. So I just told those people, hey, look, I've got a storefront now. Here's the address. You know, if you want to bring your knives in, that's cool. And so lots of them did. And then I had a big sign. I made sure I had a great big sign out front um, so people could see that. The word of mouth started to spread and we started to, you know, eventually had to hire a guy. I had so much sharpening that I had to hire a full-time guy and teach him how to sharpen. And I spent more time making knives. So, and then the retail part helped out as well. So I had a lot of, I carried Henkel and Trident and Forstner and, Mm -hmm. you know, all the popular brands. And, and I knew a lot of cooks around town too. So the word spread there and I tried to offer a a better price than like 20% off retail. Um, So I had good prices on knives. I knew what I was talking about because I had been a chef. And then we had the sharpening service. And then slowly I started to make knives and they weren't good. I wasn't, I wasn't good at all. When did you feel like you started to really get your wheels turning on the quality of your knives? It's weird because I made a lot of hunting knives and fighting knives and even some swords and my heart wasn't into it. So I have this business now that I'm running. I have an employee or two that I'm responsible for, and I, I'm feeling a little lost. My stuff's not that good. I've got a lot of work to do. And as you mentioned early on, that the running of the business, I was, I'm learning much more about that and the accounting and how much work that takes to run a business, to just keep it going, keep the wheels turning. In the meantime, I'm trying to become a good craftsman. It's like, I'm not sure I can, I don't know that I have the bandwidth to do all of this, but you know, this is, I decided like, I'm going to do this and I, and I want to become a master. That was another decision that I had made. Like once I came back from the class and I had already signed up, part of the thing about taking the class, the class was from the American Bladesmith Society. And those are the guys that issue the master's certification or the journeyman certification. So by taking the class, I had shaved a year off of my first uh, journeyman test. Coming home from that class, I thought, God, I, I could become a master. I could get a stamp that says I'm a master bladesmith. And that just lit me up. It's pretty like badass. I, it just felt cool. Yeah. You know? I don't know about you, but when I was a kid and I watched the Olympics, I'm like, God, I want to be an Olympian. And, and so this thing about, or thinking about being a master of something when I was a kid, you know, I've always heard the jack of all trades, master of none. I thought, wouldn't it be cool to be a master jeweler, a master bladesmith? That's right. badass. So once I had taken the class, I just decided like, I'm getting the master certification. I don't know what that looks like. I'm not sure how long it'll take me. I think I can do it. And so I was working towards that while running the shop and running the business. And so the, the question was, where was another turning point? Customers would come in and they could make a drawing. And, and I said, well, I'll make you whatever you want. And so they'd come in and they go, oh, I want this hunting knife. It looks like this. I go, okay, I'm going to make it. And I'd never hunted. I never cut up an animal, you know, like something I shot out in the woods. And so there were times when I was making hunting knives that I thought, this is fraudulent because I don't know this very well. Like, But the idea of making a kitchen knife at that time was overwhelming because it was so much bigger than anything I had ever forged before. I just didn't have any concept of how to forge something that wide. I had a gal come in. She was, and she had asked me to make a dagger for her with a white handle. 
and she said it was for ceremonial purposes. And I go, oh, tell me about that. She goes, well, I'm, I practice Wiccan and, you know, it's, it's a part of uh, this pagan ritual. I'm like, okay, cool. So I made her a dagger with a white handle. A few months later, she said, I want an identical one with a black handle. And I wanted the business and I wanted to make the knife. But as I was making the knife, I started to imagine, I wonder what this thing is going to be used for. Your wheels like, got turning. Yeah. I wonder, like, what kind of ritual? What kind of goat is getting sacrificed I, I or what's happening? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I thought, I'm participating in a way, whenever these tools get used, I don't want that. I'm not interested. Right. And and so then I thought, I'm on the wrong track again. And I thought, you know, it's not hunting knives. Is that what? And I went, kitchen knives. Why? Of course. That's what I need to be making. So I'd made a few kitchen knives and um, it was clear this was the right path. Now, what they needed to look like, like geometry and material and blah, 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 that what, I was still working out the details of that, but I thought, okay, this is the right track. I need to get good at this. This makes total sense. When you're running your own business, uh, brick and mortar, and, and people were still using checks a lot, right? These, this is 90s now. 92 is when I opened the downtown store. You know, there's certain things you look for to make sure you're not getting a bad check. You know, you look at the check number. Does the name match the person's driver's license? Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. And so cut back to sharpening in Seattle a few years earlier. I'm in an alley. I'm behind a restaurant called 1904, which was downtown on 4th Avenue. I'm in the alleyway. It's a Friday night. It's hot. It's summertime. I got both the back doors open. I'm finishing up. It's probably 5.30 or so. I'm finishing up their big order of sharpening. And, and some dude is standing out there looking at me as I'm sharpening these knives. And he said, hey, excuse me, what are you doing? And I go, I'm sharpening knives for 1904. And he, he said, is, is this what you do? And I go, yeah. He goes, is this your full-time job? That's kind of weird and cool. He gave me his business card. His name was Skylar Engel. And he said, uh, I write for the weekly. I also sometimes write for the New York Times. Are you, would you be interested in having me do an article on you? I'm like, yeah, sure. He goes, well, why don't you come over and we'll have lunch. We'll talk about how we're going to do this. So I had lunch with Skylar. The article never happened. We had a nice lunch. I kind of got to know him. Cut back to, we're at Bladesmiths three years later. Customers at the counter, finished his sharpening. He writes me a check. I look at the check. I'm checking the name and the number, Skylar Engel. And I look up and I go, hey, Skylar, how are you? I haven't seen you in a long time. He goes, oh, yeah, cool. We begin to talk. And he goes, hey, I never wrote that article. Would you be interested? And I go, yeah, sure. And he goes, okay, I'll come down and, and uh, you know, we'll do interviews. It'll take three days, two hours each day. And I just was like so pumped about making knives. And then I had just turned on to this kitchen knife thing. He was asking me all kinds of questions. It was quite in-depth. And at the end of it, he said, um, great, they liked the article. I didn't know who they were he was writing for. I didn't care. I thought I anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Give whatever. me publicity, man. I need some exposure. He said, I'm going to send a photographer down. The magazine wants some photographs. I'm like, oh, cool. That usually means you're going to get more, more words, right? You're going to get more space if they're going to take pictures. Right. It's not just a little blurb. So it goes, the guy's coming down on Monday. And so Monday I'm there. I got my, my place all tidy up and stuff like that. Nine o'clock, the dude shows up at the door. I know the photographer. I'd hired him before and he was like one of the most expensive guys in Seattle. And when I hired him, he was like 700 bucks for like two, two and a half hours right. in studio. Now the guy's at my front door, he's got bags of, of gear and he's got an assistant with him. So he comes in, he's setting up all of his stuff. I got my forge running. I start forging. He starts shooting pictures. And this is days of film right? The guy's got a huge bag of film and he's just firing away. About two hours into it, I'm like, hey, um, how long do you want to shoot? He goes, oh, I'm going to shoot all day. And he actually didn't leave until the last shot was sunset. So the sun had set and it's the, it's the cover photo of the article. So he was there from nine o'clock in the morning until about 630 at night, probably 200 rolls of film. So at that point, I started to think, this is a good magazine. Like somebody that's paying this dude's fee for all day. So I called Skylar. I'm like, Skylar, who, who are you writing this for? And he goes, well, it's for Savour. And Savour was the shit. It was the coolest food magazine. It was on the, on par with like National Geographic and Geo. Yeah. Like it, it just was the top shelf food magazine. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And I hung up the phone. And I thought, 
oh, this is this is big. This is a turning point. The thing was, I had only made like six chef's knives. And a major part of the article was about, here's a guy that's like making badass chef's knives. I'm like, oh, shit. The, the fear, the stick comes back out. The fear comes Here around the go. corner again, huh? Yeah. So at that point, that was also fire under your ass to, to say, all right, now I have to get really good at this. And was that the point when you started pursuing the journeyman um, certification? I had already gotten my master's certification. So I had passed those tests. And I passed those tests with with buoy knives and hunting knives. So there were no chef's knives to that point. So I'd already passed journeyman. I had just passed my master's. And that was part of what the article was about as well. It's like, hey, here's some guy doing really primitive craft in Seattle. And food was taken off. This is 97. You know, so the food network was just starting to get traction. And food celebrities, you know, chef celebrities were like a thing. And they weren't prior to that, not when I was cooking. And for people that are listening, can you just take us through bullet points, kind of the story of journeyman, how do you get certified? And then how do you get your your, your master bladesmith certification? For a journeyman, you have to put in three years first from an apprentice. And then you have to, you have to build a 10-inch knife with a five-inch handle. And uh, you have to hand forge and heat treat the whole thing yourself and and then go to a master smith shop. And the first part is you got to cut a one inch sisal rope hanging from the ceiling, no more than six inches from the end. The rope is free swinging. So you have to be able to cut that rope with one swipe, then chop a two by four in half twice. There can be no damage to the edge of the knife whatsoever. Then you need to shave hair with that part of the knife that did the chopping. And then you put the knife in a vise and bend it 90 degrees without breaking. If you pass that practical part, then you can go on and you have to make five pieces and submit them to a board of master smiths. And they look for fit and finish. If they are up to their standards for journeymen, they give you a journeyman certification and a journeyman stamp with which you can stamp your knives. Then you have to wait. If you want to go on to master's, you have to wait two more years before you can test for master's. Essentially, you have to do the same chopping, cutting tests, but with a piece of Damascus, which is folded steel. You have to have 300 layers in the steel, but that doesn't mean that you've folded it 300 times. So if you start with five layers of steel and you stretch it out and then cut it into five pieces and restack that, now you got 25 pieces. Got it. So you could stretch that out into five pieces and restack it. And so you can build layer count kind of, it's not fast, but it's faster than just folding it. You know, for our listeners to give a little bit of context, what's the spectrum of your standard kitchen knife? So you go to Bed Bath & Beyond, you pick pick out, you know, a, a decent knife. Yeah. Could that be one one block of, of metal? Yeah, it's usually homogenous one type of steel. But if you see knives that have a patterning on the side or a layering on the side, they're usually somewhere between 50 and 100 layers of steel. So this blade you had to create was around 300 or it was specifically 300. Yeah, 300 or more. Or more. Yeah. And at, in what situation would you do more? It's an aesthetic choice mm-hmm. or it's a strength choice. So if if we're talking about Japanese style steel where you're, you're starting from ore and then you're going to make a sword out of it, probably have to fold that 16 times to strengthen and clean the material and even out the carbon content. So it, it depends on what the objective is. If you're starting with industrial steel and layering it up, 300 has a nice look to it, but but you may want to make it look more like Japanese steel. So you may want to go to 800 or 1,000 layers. And, and how long does that typically take to, to do a layer or that many layers? I mean, you could do it in a day. You could get it with 1,000 layers in a day. It sounds like a long day. Yeah, it's a lot of pounding and grinding. It sounds like the process for the uh, master certification is similar, but you have to go back with a slightly different set. More, more complicated material. More complicated material. Tell me yeah. a little bit more about the complication of the material. To, to fold the steel, and the steel has to be perfect. There can be no flaws, no inclusions in the Damascus. And there's lots of opportunities to, to have an inclusion in the 300 layers. So the material has to be totally clean, 
perfect. And then you have to do the chopping and the bending and the, you know, shaving and the cutting the rope and all that stuff. If you pass that part of the test, then you have to make five blades, one of which is a 15th century quillion dagger. And daggers are very challenging to make because they have to be symmetrical in every axis. And of the five blades that you submit to the board, to the master smith board, they have to be flawless. So the smallest scratch or a, a fit that's not perfect, any flaw whatsoever will get you rejected. You're going into this with this pursuit of excellence, this concept of Kaizen that um, maybe you had adopted early on or understood early on or started to, to adopt as you were going. It, it, this, a lot of this, this, this industry, this craft is the pursuit of excellence. Yeah. So when you're going into this, you're, you're saying, well, I might fail, but I'm not going to. Like there is a chance that there could be a flaw, but I'm not going to allow that to happen. I mean, you just do your best. And, yeah. and I, I mean, for the master's blades, you, you look at the work. You just can't bullshit yourself. You just have to you have to really look at them. You have to stand back and and make a real clear evaluation. And part of it is you're so into the work. You're such a part of the work that sometimes you can't see the flaws. And I had a friend who was a, an engineer and a machinist. And so when I thought they were good, I said, "Okay, I got to have him look at them." And so then he said, "Well, I kind of see this thing and I see this thing. And he was right. And I, I just didn't see it. And I don't know if it's because I didn't want to see it and I didn't want to go back in and fix it or that I couldn't see it. But once it was pointed out, it became obvious. So it's right. like, okay, I got to fix those. And then I fixed it and I showed him again. And he's like, yeah, those look good to me. And so I went, okay, I think they're perfect. And so then you just pack them up, take them to Atlanta and submit them and cross your fingers and and hope they get through the wicket. So you have this this big article that comes out, um, and this is still in your shop in Seattle. At what point did you yeah. say, okay, things are starting? I'm starting to get some traction. Yeah. Business is going well. Did you did you have the the auction business model at that point, or were you just selling knives retail and shipping them at that point, or had you adopted that model yet? So this is 1997, 98. You know the article. I'm I'm having breakfast with my girlfriend and I go, I think this is going to be good. We're talking about color photographs and this is a big national magazine. Circulation was like 500,000. She said, do you think you get some orders off of that? And I go, I think it might get like 20 or something like that. I think it'd be pretty good. And, um, and then the magazine started to hit. So as it ships out, it doesn't ship out nationally simultaneously, you know, as they, put those things in the mail, they hit certain parts of the country first. And so phones started ringing and I was getting calls from the East Coast saying, we want to buy some of your knives. How many in the set? And I go, oh, there's 17 different pieces in the set. And I'd have people go, I want one of each. I'm like, oh, okay. And so I have a loose leaf. There's no computer. Like I have a loose leaf notebook and a pen and I'm just writing their name and number down and what they want. And then I get a credit card and a $20 deposit. And we filled up four loose leaf notebooks with orders. And I, both lines were ringing. I had people walking into my shop with like handmade suits and handmade shoes and cell phones. I've never seen a cell phone before. $100,000 watch on their wrist. And they're like, oh yeah, I want how many set? I'll, I'll take two sets. You know, my mind was blown. It was like two thousand, twenty five hundred dollars for a set of knives. But it also freaked me out. Like, how the hell am I going to build all these knives? I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to. This is totally new. So it was thrilling and frightening simultaneously. Good problem. Good problem. Although one that a lot of small companies self destruct on. It's a good way to drive it right into the ground. But you know, just keep paddling. Just keep paddling. So this this was late nineties, and so we just started crunching on the orders. I just had to manage those orders. Started to get a computer set up. Set proper expectations on timelines, and give yeah. yourself enough time to do it yeah. well. And people would say, "When can I get that?" I'm like, "It's two years." They're like, "Are you serious?" I'm like. Yeah, sorry. There's like hundreds of orders in front of you. I'm one guy and they're all made by hand. And they're like, okay, call me when they're ready. And you know, that $20 deposit gives them the license to bug the shit out of you if they want to, <laughs> right? Because they can call you up like, where's my order? But most people were totally cool. So I just, from like 98 to 2000, I just crunched along through those orders. Then my lease was up. Seattle was even busier at that point. My girlfriend and I decided to get married. I'd started a rhythm of building and sending these knives out. 
and I got continued to get good press. So people were, were giving me kudos for what we were building. And I'd refined the design and I figured out what I was making. In 2000, they wouldn't give me another lease. I was worried. Seattle was getting very busy. Real estate was expensive. Mm-hmm. Single story building to put a forge in was going to be I thought if I get 30 days notice, I'm screwed. I got so much gear that I got to move. I got nowhere to go. They're thinking increased density, redevelopment, all along those lines. Great for them. Yeah, great for them. And you're thinking this is not a quick move. So my girlfriend and I were going to get married and I thought we could live anywhere. Let's go to Provence. I've got the the internet thing looks like it's going to catch on. Uh, We've got all these orders. Like, let's go live somewhere beautiful and get a big ass barn and just, you know, do this craftsman thing. I think this is going to work out. I just got to keep making kitchen knives. She was level-headed and said, uh, you know, how about if we just move out to the country first and try that before we move to another country? So we moved to Ferndale. Ferndale. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Have you ever, had you ever heard of Ferndale no, before? I had no idea what Ferndale was. So why did you select Ferndale out of all the places? We drew a two-hour circle around Seattle because I said, I want to be close to an airport. If we, if we need to you know, take off and go on vacation. I want to drive five hours to get to an international airport. Keeps coming back to the driving. I think the drive, the lack of driving for you or the... I don't want to drive. You don't want to drive. Yeah. (laughs) I don't want to drive. And if I want to book out of town, I want to be able to jump on a plane and do it. So we looked everywhere. We looked east of Seattle. We looked out on the islands and nothing felt right. Nothing. And, And then I went up to Orcas and I was coming back. I looked at a house up on Orcas and I'm riding back on the ferry and I'm like, I don't think the, the ferry thing, I don't think it's That's too a squeeze much. point. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit too much of a bottleneck. And I met a friend that was on the ferry and we we're just shooting the shit. And he, he's like, have you checked out Ferndale? I'm like, where's Ferndale? He goes, oh, it's North of Bellingham. He goes, it's beautiful up there. You should come check it out. So I got home, talked to her. We got on the internet, you know, looking at houses in Ferndale and picked out six houses that could all had outbuildings and uh, went and looked at the first one. It was like there was a church next door, it was a 50 mile an hour road, the power lines that weren't in the pictures, you know, so there's so it was like, oh, this isn't going to work. And the realtor said, you know, I know you got five other houses to look at, but there's one that I know of that's not on here, has a barn, has a pond, brick rambler. I go, let's go look. And it was Perfect. I mean, as soon as we drove to the end of the road and saw the house, we're like, this is it. We're home. So at that point, you did not have your space um, over in Sunnyland, correct? So at what, so you move your business to the barn. Yeah. And it took you a little bit of time to get the barn all outfitted to be on par with your shop before. Business, what was that like for you when you had the storefront retail in Seattle going to, I mean, was there enough presence with the inter, with the boom of the internet um, to be able to take that business online and the, the word of mouth was still out there? Yeah, so I still had a bunch of orders. I still had notebooks full of orders to fill. And the fact that customers were coming in the door every you know 15 minutes or so was a relief. And the fact that I wasn't doing is all the sharpening and that I had no employees. So I was back to solo guy, just doing my craft and not doing the service part. So that was a relief and and kind of um, it felt right. It felt good to me. You know, running a business and, and taking care of employees is a consumes a bunch of time and energy. And so it was nice to come back down to just me and just focus on, you know, my craft. Just manage you. Yeah. That's all you had to do. Yeah. So you're. Everything was operating at the same capacity it was before. People were uh, hypothetically calling you from your website or they got your number word of mouth. Yep. And then at what point did you decide, I have to take this to a separate space away from my home? What, when, when did you end up opening the shop um, in Sunnyland? The business started to taper off. So the, the orders, I, I was getting to the end of the orders. My website was up, but I wasn't... It, it just wasn't coming in anymore. It was like, it looked like it was running out. And I actually thought, so I was probably 42 by then. And um, I thought I might have to go back to school because I, I wasn't sure how to goose this thing. I wasn't, I had my website, but I didn't want to pay for advertising. My wife was working doing customer service out at Ocean, uh, Ocean Kayak. I said, I might have to go back to school. I might, I, I think I might, I want to go back and become an engineer because I'm not sure how to goose this thing. And then I got a call from Cook's Illustrated. 
So Cook's Illustrated is a big cooking magazine. They didn't do any, there's no advertisement in Cook's Illustrated because they don't want to be swayed by advertisers. They don't want to have to lean an article one way because KitchenAid is paid for two or three pages of advertisement. So it's, it was sort of like a technical cooking magazine. It, it is cool in that they go, we want to make ribs. And so we're going to make ribs. We're going to pick the top five recipes that we know. And then we're going to cook a thousand pounds of ribs until we give you, here's the best way to cook ribs, simple, inexpensive. And I always dug the magazine when I was cooking. I thought these guys are the shit. They're like scientists. Right. And they called me up and they said, uh, Hey, we want to try one of your kitchen knives. And unfortunately we have to call you if we could buy one anywhere not directly from you, we would, but unfortunately we got to get it from you. So uh, can you overnight it? I'm like, oh, you know, I got nothing right now, but tomorrow I can send you one. They're like, that's cool. Don't soup it up. I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. They're all souped up. Like everything I know is in this knife. So there's nothing more I can do. And they paid full price for it. It was like 400 bucks at the time. Um, which I thought was a lot for a chef's knife. And and so, you know, I thought they're going to kill me because they love inexpensive products that work well. So if there are two Dutch ovens and one's $400 and one's $40 and they both work the same, they're going to tell you not to pay for the $400 Dutch oven and get the $40 one because it works just fine. It's the same pot roast. So I thought they're going to like my knife but they're going to kill me on the price. They're going to say, yeah, it's cool and comfortable, but damn, it's expensive. But whatever, they paid it and I sent, I overnighted the knife to them and then I just kind of held my breath and thought, I know I'm going to get spanked. I just don't know how hard. Right. <laughs> and then the magazine, they, they overnighted me a magazine when they came out. And so I got to see it pretty much on the first day that anybody else got to see it. And they usually line up all the products on the right-hand page and they put them in the order of, of preference. And then they have the, the ones they like, the ones they recommend, and then the ones they don't recommend. And I thought, ah, oh, shit. So I opened the article and they actually gave me a separate box over on the left-hand page. And they said, $400 chef's knife, is it worth it? And they went on to say it was the best knife they had ever tested in their kitchen. And then another flurry of orders came in my books were packed up again. And then my wife decided she was going to become a financial planner, pass the tests. And then we decided to move to Olympia because her mom was in the business and she could work together with her mom. So I moved the shop once again, Ferndale to Olympia, set up a new shop, industrial space, built the business back up, hired somebody in the office. So now I now I'm not doing all the accounting and all the web stuff. I hired somebody that good with numbers. And so she did that part and kind of kept me organized. And then eventually I hired a shop helper. And so we ran that business for a while. And I just kept trying to build it out, do the Kaizen thing. I kept looking at like, how do I do this better? How do I make my website better? So we were in Olympia for 12 years. And then my business continued to grow. And it was in Olympia that we did the auction thing. For someone that has very clearly seen, I mean, you keep bumping into these kind of these dead ends at certain points, but you're on the right direction. You're on the right direction. How did something like an auction model make sense? You've been going and, and it's clearly working very well for you. You've been doing kind of the standard retail. You've been doing the standard, um, you know, someone finding you online or word of mouth. Yeah. How did your brain go? Okay, well, I'm going to try this new model. Or was it something that had been presented to you? Or was it just out of necessity that you created yeah. this, this business model? I like this question. So, you know, I was making a lot of chef's knives. I was making a lot of 8-inch and 10-inch carbon steel chef's knife. Back to the sharpening business, like once you solve all the problems, then it just becomes a job. Like you got to turn out product after, you know, one piece after another. And it begins to lose some of its life. It begins to lose some of its allure my backlog was still years. And so, you know, now my wife's a financial planner. She's passed all these super heavy tests yep. and she knows the world of finance. She's working with people that have high net worth value. And she's like, you know, if you've got a two-year back order, you're not charging enough. And now by this time, I'm charging $600 for a chef's knife. This is unheard of. Right. Like this is a crazy amount of money for one knife, in my opinion. But I'm just like a guy that works out of his barn, you know. I drive an old pickup truck and 
And um, she goes, none of that matters. Whatever you think, it doesn't matter. The, the fact that you've got a two-year wait list shows you that there's a demand which outstrips your production. You're not charging enough. And so I just didn't want to hear that, you know. And and then I sent a knife to a customer in Silicon Valley, and uh, he wrote me a like two, three-page letter, very well written, and he just broke it down why I wasn't charging enough money. Customers telling you again. Customers telling me how to do my business. Is like, and I showed it to her, and she's like, "I told you." And I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. You guys are probably right. I don't know. But uh, I was afraid to charge more because as an artist craftsman mind, you just want to please the people. And you, and you don't want to, I didn't want to make a mistake that would seem arrogant. Like, oh, I got a two-year back. I'm going to charge a thousand bucks for a chef's knife and have everybody go away. I think the party's going to stop. As soon as I say it's a thousand bucks, everyone's going to go away and go, that guy's an asshole. A hundred, a thousand dollars, no way. And then a business would vaporize. That's what I imagine. I would end, I'd put a bullet in my head, you know, metaphorically with asking for too much. So, okay, this guy's telling me to charge more. My wife's telling me to charge more. I go, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a Damascus chef's knife, which I would normally charge $1,800 for. I'm going to post it on eBay for three days, not an extremely long auction, three days, plenty right. of time for people to bid. And I'll send out to my mailing list, hey, this piece is available because there are, now people are going to have to wait two years. If you wanted to order it, it would be two years before I could get to it. It's available now. And I said, we'll, we'll see. We'll all see what the market will bear for this. And so I posted the knife and in 10 minutes, it was at $2,100. And, you know, basically my wife said, I told you. And so then, you know, by day two, it was at $4,000. Starting to blow your mind a little bit. It completely blew my mind. Yeah. Like I it wasn't, I didn't quite get it. It was like, this is crazy. And then we were coming up here to camp out at Mount Baker the day that it closed. So it closed on a Friday at like three o'clock. So we were cruising into Bellingham at like, whatever 245 and a friend of ours had a had a commercial business and and we go hey can we pop by and look at your computer we want to see the end of this auction and she's like oh yeah sure come on up so she pulls up the ebay thing on her computer by the time we got there it was at six thousand dollars which i just couldn't believe it was like unbelievable and in the last two minutes it went to eight grand and we literally, we all were laughing so hard. We fell on the floor and we were just hit slapping each other and punching each other and uh, just cracking up like, I cannot believe this. And so then we went to Fred Myers and bought a big cooler and filled it with a bunch of booze and went up on Mount Baker and just did it right. a crazy party. Yeah, you did it right. So these people were, as they do on eBay, waiting for that moment to, someone's not paying attention. I'm going to click it up. And you guys are just sitting there and your your mind is steadily getting blown. And so it sounds like, that's when that business model clicked. You said, well, now you can really start to, you're not driving, right? You've eliminated the driving part. Right. You, it's just you. Yep. And, and, and it sounds like you are able to focus on the products that you like the, the art that you wanted to create, the things that you wanted to do. And then people could bid on that. Is that how that works? Well, it, it hadn't quite developed that. I mean, that far. So, so I thought, was that an, was that an accident? You know, was that an anomaly? Or what was that real? And so I, I said, okay, we need to do that again. So a couple of months later, we did another one and it had a similar performance. And then I got contacted by a businessman and he, he who have, was familiar with auction. And, and he said, you know, one time could be a mistake, two times as a pattern, three times as a market. So I knew I had to go three times and it was consistent. And by the end of the third one, I had sort of acclimated you know my my mind had acclimated to that this market was much bigger and there was far more money out there and interest in what i was doing than i ever believed so that's when it became a model like we're doing this i'm 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 continuing to do this do, do you still get a i told you so from your wife every time one sells no she's she's laid off on yeah, i yeah, told yeah, you yeah, so yeah, yeah no she's cool that's awesome. So, and that's, so that's the business model. And then, so does, did that business model take your pipeline, pair it back just to just the network of people that wanted to buy a Kramer knife? Yeah. So, so I knew that that was 
was a venue for me. And I was getting close to the end of my orders of, of everything that was on the books. The other thing that began to happen is that people who, let's say you you had ordered a knife and it was two years before your order came up and, and you had seen the stuff that was going on on eBay. And so then you're like, hey, Bob, I know my chef's knife has just come up on your, would you mind me making a second one for me? And I felt bad, like, oh, this guy's waited two years. And so I said, okay, I'll make it. So I got a double order, right? So, but that started to happen more and more. And then each time I would put a knife up on eBay, sometimes these guys were flipping a knife that I had just sold them for 1200 bucks. They were flipping it and turning it into 4,000 or $5,000. And that's when I went, okay, that's not cool. That's not why I made you a second knife. Like I did that for you. I didn't do that right. for you to start a business. And so I went, okay, I got to change this model. And I'd finished out my orders. And then there was another, another guy contacted me and ended up following me for a while, a writer. He wouldn't tell me who the magazine was. It didn't matter to me. I was just like, wanted to tell him my story. And I mean, the, I, the guy went to Japan with me. He went to the Atlanta Blade show with me. He came and stayed in my shop for a week. And we were in Japan for like two weeks. And I'm like, this is a serious deal. I don't know what this is, but this is a serious deal. He kind of told me it was more about the industry, cutlery industry, I thought. But he's spending a lot of time with me. And then he called me and he said, the article's coming out tomorrow. Or no, it's coming out Monday. And he said, but it's going to change your life. And I go, ah, should I get another, another one? Job? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do I need to deliver pizzas? And he goes, no, I don't think it'll be for the worst. Um, but I'm overnighting you the article. I'm going to FedEx it and you'll get it on Saturday and uh, call me after you read it. And it was for the New Yorker. Oh man. And I went, Oh God, that's a subscription is circulation is a million. Right. And I'm like, wow, if Savor was a half million and this is a million and the demographic of people that read the New Yorker, I'm like, here we go. We're, this is happening again. And I didn't want to get into the whole of like all of these orders to build. And I'm still, pretty much by myself, except for the gal in the front. And I agonized, like, how many orders am I going to take? How am I going to manage this? And it was it really made me kind of nauseous. I was like, overwhelmed, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And this is not what I want to do. I don't want to make chef's knives for the rest of my life. And then I thought, I'm not taking any orders. I'm going to stop taking orders. So now I'm not driven by orders. So I can do the auction thing. And I'm going to make whatever I want. I'll put together a mailing list so that everybody that contacts me through this article, I'll put them on the list and, and we'll keep them apprised of what's coming up, what's happening next, when something's up on eBay. And so that was the that was the big transformation. That was it. There's these like almost these like <clears throat> level up moments of it all came down to people finding you writing articles and you having no idea what the, which magazine they were for. Yeah. Someone saying they're going to overnight it to you, you getting it, you're holding your breath and then next level so that's that's amazing and you're in bellingham yay why bellingham what that's do you love about bellingham gorgeous it's fabulous we're close to baker close to the water people here are totally cool they're adventurous they're um progressive they're inclusive they're well read they're educated they like adventure it feels like a small town which i love there's not a traffic problem the weather's great and so you're here in Bellingham now. Your shop is here in Bellingham now. Um, and you're located right across the street from Otherlands, which is a great, uh, awesome great brewery. brewery. Yeah. Um, we had the owners on the show. They're, they're awesome oh, as cool. well. The food's good. Yeah. So you have a nice pit stop across the street. Yeah, it's fantastic. Those guys yeah. are awesome. Listening to your story, you had this relentless pursuit of your dream. Yep. Um, and didn't you kind of had your horse blinders on at many points. There yep. was, you know, opened them up for the right people. Yep. For somebody that is that has the same dream of becoming a master of fill in the blank, yeah. what what kind of advice beyond just listening to, the, to your story do you have for somebody like that? Uh, trust your gut, uh, stick to your guns, buckle up because it's it's a lot of work. I think people think that I'm going to have my own business and then I can work whatever you want. You end up working <laughs> so much more. I mean, evenings, weekends, holidays for years. My barn in Ferndale, we didn't have any heat for two years. I mean, I would, I'd wear a full-on insulated Carhartt zip-up suit. My glasses would freeze, literally freeze up 
from, you know, wearing a mask and, 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 and so there's all that work that comes, but if that's what you want, then you just got to do, you know, you just got to keep going. You got to keep walking up the mountain. And, um, and so that's the stick to your gun part. Decisions, making decisions are so crucial. And, it, and a lot of times I don't think people understand. I don't think they're committed to the decision. To decide means to cut away from the rest, to decise. And, and when you decide, then you've taken those other options and you've pushed them away. You've picked one thing and you just you stay on that. I mean, I think that that's really important. You know, you think about anybody that's like incredibly good at what they do, whether it's an Olympic athlete or, or someone that rises to the top of their game, they just stayed on it and you keep slogging on. And there's lots of times where it feels lonely and it feels like it sucks and it's never going to get good. But eventually that goes away. And then, and then you, you know, you get to the clearing and you're like, oh man, this is amazing that all that hard work has to come first. If a decision did not have pros or cons, it would not be a decision. Mm -hmm. It would be a no brainer. I'm just going to walk this way. Yeah. And at every point you've had this gut, gut check. Bob, thank you so much for joining us and spending some time um, in the studio, listening to the, the questions and answering them very thoughtfully and precisely. And uh, I say this every time when I have the opportunity to sit down with someone like yourself, I appreciate you. I appreciate your contribution back to this community, to business owners, and you're an inspiration to a business owner like myself that has not been doing it as long as you have to just continue forward and follow the vision and the gut. So I appreciate you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you giving me so much time and asking such insightful questions and let me just roll and ramble. So thanks for having me. Our guest today was Bob Kramer of Kramer Knives. Check out Bob's business at www.kramerknives.com, on Facebook at Kramer Knives, and on Instagram at at Bob Kramer Knives. Thank you again for listening to the Building Bellingham podcast. Building Bellingham is a community podcast exploring leadership, challenges, failure, and mindset with entrepreneurs right here in Whatcom County, Washington. You can catch recorded episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any of your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Be the first to hear about upcoming guests on the Building Bellingham Facebook and Instagram pages, as well as the Building Bellingham YouTube channel. This episode was produced and edited by Tiffany Holden. Our videography is done by Cooper Hansley. Social media and community support is by Taylor Beal. To learn more about the team behind the podcast, check out our website at www.livebellinghamnow.com or search Cohen Group NW on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or LinkedIn. From the whole Building Bellingham podcast team, thank you for listening.